board. Take it away, Marianne. Good afternoon. Welcome to our ESP sponsored webinar, The Basics for International Collaborations. I'm Marianne Kaiser from Arkansas, a four year member of the Global Relations Committee. And our webinar logistics person is Peggy Compton from the University of Wisconsin, who is the chair of our Global Relations Committee. Some of our logistics, most of you have joined with your audio and video off. And if you will keep that audio off, that will be great so we don't have a lot of background conversations. And you may enter your questions in the chat box. And then if you do see multiple people's video after the presentation begins, you may wish to click the upper right hand corner of your screen and you can toggle between the gallery and the speaker view for a better experience if you have a really small screen. So just remember to enter your questions in the chat box. So our agenda today will be our Columbia Aquaculture Exchange, the Cambodian Youth Pursuing Careers in Extension, and the Guinea-Bissau Cashew Farming, Clemson University Partnership with South Carolina Farmer, North and South Carolina for-profit and non-profit businesses, and the government of Guinea-Bissau. Our, today we are pleased to welcome experienced Extension Global Collaborators to our webinar. Our first presenters are a team working in Arkansas. Herbert Quintero holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Fisheries and Aquaculture from Auburn University. He is working as the University of Arkansas Extension Aquaculture Specialist at the Lone Oak Fish Disease Diagnostic Laboratory. Dr. Quintero has worked on fish and shrimp production and nutrition, water quality, fish reproduction, and fish diseases. Originally from Columbia, Dr. Quintero has visited feed mills and fish and shrimp farms in 23 countries, distributed in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and China. His co-presenter today is Dr. Pamela Moore who holds a PhD in higher education from Jackson State University and a JD Master in Public Policy from Harvard. She is the Associate Dean for Global Engagement at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, and she has extensive experience as a rural development practitioner in the United States and overseas. Originally from Greenville, Mississippi, Dr. Moore has worked on projects associated with Ghana, in Nigeria, in Africa, Guyana and Colombia in South America, Mexico, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, China, Pakistan, and Asia, including Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. In 2017, Dr. Moore collaborated with Dr. Quintero to implement a two-way exchange program for aquaculture students at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and the La Angostura Sina Center in Huila, Colombia. Their presentation will give an overview of the academic and cultural activities developed during the exchange program in 2018. So take it away, Herbert and okay. Pamela. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we just want to share um, this uh, project, uh, Developing the Next Generation of Aquaculture Leaders. Um, and basically, um, our idea was to strengthen the for workforce uh, in a global economy for students in, uh, in Arkansas as well as in uh, Willa, Colombia. Uh, the implementing, implementing partners were uh, obviously the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff uh, through the Department of Aquaculture and Fisheries and the Office of International Programs and Studies, both of them uh, under the School of Aquaculture, uh, Agriculture, Fisheries and Human Sciences. Also, the SENA, Servicio Nacional de Aprendizaje from the Ministry of Labor, Bogota, Colombia, and uh, specifically the Centro de Formación Langostura in uh, Huila. The funding partners for this particular project uh, included the U.S. Department of State, um, 
U.S. embassies abroad, uh, particularly in Colombia for this project, and uh, the Association of Partners of the Americas. Um, this project was funded through uh, something called the Innovation Fund, uh, and this particular fund supports the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Initiative, which is a collaboration between government, uh, partners, business sector, et cetera. Um, we uh, responded to the request for proposal issued uh, in support of exchanges between the U.S. and Colombia. So how was this project initiated? And, and today we really are focusing on the basics of collaboration. And in most instances, uh, a collaboration of this nature begins when faculty and staff uh, have an interest in international engagement. So in this case, uh, when Dr. Quintero walked into my office in the fall, uh, fall semester of 2014, expressed his interest in uh, establishing partnerships, uh, we began a dialogue. Um, he uh, joined a working group uh, that we had in progress that was funded through an 1890 USDA capacity building grant. And uh, that relationship uh, was the foundation of the evolution of this project. Uh, then in, in uh, December 2016, uh, during uh, one vacation I had in Colombia, um, I was able to uh, go and visit a Langostuna Center. We were aware of the um, of this uh, request for proposals from the the 100,000 Partners of the Americas or Strong Initiatives, and then uh, so I got in contact with them and uh, see their facilities, and and then uh, when the opportunity came up. Uh, we were just ready for, for uh, start establishing the collaboration. Okay, so the uh, actual grant application was submitted uh, around March of the spring semester of 2017, and uh, by early summer of that same year, we were notified that our grant had been funded. So uh, for implementing the partnership, um, we did it, uh, work through the basically looking at the strengths of each institution. So in our case at UAPB, uh, we have a strong aquaculture program and uh, as well as an extension program that is uh, based with the industry, uh, farm producers, and uh, also um, we have a, a huge uh, diversity of uh, the aquaculture industry. And uh, the, the main strength for uh, comparing during this uh, uh, project was the fact that we had a health diagnostic uh, center. Um, then uh, in Sena, the Sena Langostura, uh, we just found out that they, the most uh, um, focus that they had were, was in the value added products. So we started uh, working on, on, on that in those two areas, uh, value added products and fish diseases. And uh, in the case of the Office of International Programs and Studies, what we brought to the collaboration were best practices and education abroad programming, uh, logistical support in terms of uh, travel related matters. Um, and um, we, um, we uh, I guess you could say the department brought the expertise in that field, exactly. and then we brought expertise in terms of how do you build effective uh, exchanges. So the program just uh, developed by the, was uh, initiated with uh, two faculty from UAPB, one OAPS staff, and two graduate students, and two undergraduate students, and from Sena, uh, two faculty and five students. Um, the priority outcomes of the work uh, were the first one obviously looking at the students to receive the value training uh, in their areas of the study. On the left, you may see um, uh, a practice, a hands-on practice in uh, value-added products uh, from the point of uh, processing the fish, doing fillets, and then getting to the final product of producing a sausage in this case. 
On the right side in Arkansas, uh, you may see um, fish diagnostics and also uh, a training in one of the farms with a checking for triploid carps. Um, also, uh, we have um, as an outcome field visits and experiential learning uh, from both uh, from students in in Willa as well as in Arkansas, uh, looking at the industry and their best practices and looking from the perspective of the producers. Uh, students were also able to better understand their industry of interest from a global perspective. Uh, that's a very important objective of, of the Office of International Programs and Studies. Uh, we are not just focusing on how to make study abroad work, but uh, our goal is to promote internationalization throughout the university. And I should also mention that uh, there's a learning process about what's happening in the world when students participate in these projects. Uh, I, I should have mentioned that uh, for the passport visa application process, it took six months because Colombia was coming out of uh, civil war and right. the U.S. government was screening applicants to the T. So we, we had to work with our students to help them appreciate you know, why it's taking so long for certain things to happen. Uh, another important outcome of this project is that not only the participants, but other students, faculty, and staff at our respective institutions really benefited through cultural exposure, drawing upon opportunities to improve language skills, learn about the respective countries involved. Um, in one particular case at UAPB, we had a student from South Africa who met the group every day in the cafeteria because he wanted to practice his Spanish. So it wasn't just US students, but also international students who benefited. Uh, in terms of the outcomes for the faculty, um, both UAPB as well as uh, SENA, uh, faculty and staff that they depend on their knowledge on the, uh, on the relevant fields um, in, in both cases, uh, but not only in terms of research, but also in extension and curriculum. Um, in terms of SENA, SENA wants to um, uh, try to implement uh, the extension uh, part of, uh, um, of the training in, uh, in Colombia. And for us, uh, the curriculum was important to uh, get ideas for uh, implementing here in, in UAPB. Another important outcome uh, of this project, let's see, um, okay, here we go, okay, is that our two respective institutions were able to lay the foundation for long-term collaboration. Um, a $25,000 grant in the big scheme of things is not a lot 20, of money. Yeah, 25, uh, yes, but if, uh, if someone says, hey, I'm giving you $25,000 to have conversations, to promote exchanges, that really is a nice chunk of money and helps to support a sustainable relationship. That's a much better model than simply sending documents by email, generating paper MOUs that you know, may not ever uh, lead to any real tangible activity. Another uh, important outcome of the work and, uh, and uh, another important uh, outcome of participation, participation in the 100,000 Strong Americas Initiative is the recognition that comes to the uh, participating uh, institutions, not only through uh, our own local and regional media efforts, but also through the partners network. Uh, if you receive a 100,000 Strong Americas grant, uh, each year uh, partners will have some event to recognize the awardees, your, your institution is on their website, and in Colombia, the embassy hosted all the uh, partners there at, through a reception. Right. So that's another nice perk of this uh, project. 
In terms of funding mechanisms, again, we're talking about the basics of collaboration. How do you make these kinds of activities work, especially if you're a small institution with a small budget? So in our case, we draw upon support uh, from multiple avenues. Uh, in this particular case, um, for example, there, there was another project on campus, the Males of Color Initiative, uh, that uh, covered the cost of one round trip airfare. And I had already mentioned how this project, in a way, built upon the capacity building grant that kind of raised awareness and brought faculty together and initiated a desire to do this. Right. So um, additionally, we have an uh, institutional co-chair from both institutions, um, UAPB as well as Sena Langostura, uh, not only in terms of the time and effort of faculty and staff, but also in terms of the facilities that were provided for students, uh, meals and lodging, ground transportation, cultural activities, and in, in the case of uh, Sena, um, the passport and visa application and all the logistics uh, related to, to that effect. And finally, uh, we think it's also important for students to bring some sweat equity to the process. We uh, require all study abroad students to engage in some sort of fun fundraising, whether it's a GoFundMe site or having a booth at a campus unity festival, uh, saving their own funds. But uh, as a general rule, we will not um, we will not bring resources to bear if the students are not also involved in the fundraising. So um, that's that's all uh, that we have. Uh, we area. have time for questions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we have our contact information there. Um, you may contact us anytime. So thank you, Pamela and, and Herbert, for sharing your experiences with the exchange with University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff, and Columbia. Peggy, do you have any questions for them? Nothing has been entered into the chat box yet, so I just encourage you, if you do have a question for Dr. Moore or Dr. Quintero, to go ahead and use our chat box. Marianne, why don't um, we go ahead and send the screen share over to Kevin in Oregon, and while we're doing that, um, you can read his bio. Okay, I will. Dr. Kevin Gamble earned his PhD with an emphasis on instructional technologies and research methodologies from Iowa State University. He is an ESP Life member, the immediate past president of Gamma Chapter of Oregon State, and he is retired from North Carolina State University with 25 years experience. Dr. Gamble served as Chief Information Officer and Associate Director for the United States Department of Agriculture's National E-Extension Initiative, a consortial distance learning effort of the nation's seven in using communications and information technologies in international development, having worked on projects in Ethiopia, Ghana, Mali, Malawi, Malaysia, Yemen, Costa Rica, and Honduras. He lives in Bend, Oregon, where he enjoys snowboarding and golf. Kevin will discuss the current ESP collaboration with Cambodia. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's my uh, pleasure to uh, share a project of ESP that we've been working on for about four years until we uh, uh, finally got it started. So uh, the project is a collaboration between ESP, uh, the USAID Feed the Future Lab at Kansas State University, which is the Sustainable uh, Intensification and Innovation Lab, and with the Royal University of uh, Agriculture in Cambodia with their Center for Excellence in Sustainable Ag uh, Innovation and Nutrition. Um, we went through several iterations on our way to doing this project, uh, working with our partners, and basically what we came up with was this idea of uh, increasing opportunities for Cambodian, Cambodian youth to pursue careers in agriculture and extension. Uh, the project objective, and as I said, we worked on this for four years and we went through several iterations, not only with our collaborator in the, at Kansas State in the Sustainable Intensification uh, Lab, but also with 
ESP and the ESP membership and the ESP board to get us to where we're at today. So we wrote uh, several proposals, but basically well, what we decided on was when we talked to, when we went to the uh, Feed the Future people, we, we went with the, uh, with one idea and, and as a good partnership, it evolved and it changed. And basically what we came down to was one of the biggest issues they were facing was encouraging uh, bright, prospective, top performing students to enter careers in agricultural and and eventually into extension work. And uh, and what they suggested to us was that an investment in people and, and an investment in future extension workers would be uh, a very meaningful and impactful thing to do. And so that's the that's what we decided on. We wrote the proposal, we went through several iterations of that, and we got uh, board approval for that. Some of the goals of what we were looking at and why we did this were, one, we wanted to address an important global need. We wanted to do something that made a difference. Uh, we wanted to increase awareness and, and involvement and opportunities for our ESP members to engage with the global extension community. Uh, those of us who have done a lot of work in, in international work know that the U.S. extension system is made, it really not involved that much in, in, in the global extension community uh, to the extent that other countries are involved. And we can point to many countries in Europe and, and other places that are doing lots of work in global extension work. Uh, but we, we in the US maybe aren't as engaged with that community as, as maybe we should be. And that's one of the things that kind of drove us in this way is that uh, those of us who have done this kind of work know that uh, these international experiences can be life-changing kinds of experiences for, for those, you know, not only do we want to do some good work and help people, but they, there's benefits that come to us personally from having this kind of involvement. Uh, so they're, they're life-changing experiences, but I think the bottom line is that we come back to the U.S. and we come back as better extension educators. We're, we're, we, we do a better job at what we do here from having had these experiences. Uh, so th that was one of our primary goals, but we also wanted to make an impact and do something important uh, uh, to help people. And uh, uh, the other goals of the project, we wanted something that would scale. So we didn't want to do just a one-off thing that uh, that may or may not have the impact that we want. So uh, that was where we got into the investing in people, but we wanted also something that that as we invest in people, these people would also get back and we could keep this this project going um, and so and then we wanted it to be sustainable and and I think that's where you know the ESP membership and how we funded this uh, is, a, is an important part of that component uh, so people always want to ask so, so how did we fund this how did we get this going and what are we doing so the original plan from the global relations committee and again we worked on this through three chairs and three ESP presidents. We worked on it for a while to get to where we're at today. But the original plan was to raise the money for the project through member contributions. And we're thinking, we have a lot of ESP members, small contributions of five or $10. Um, and if we looked at it, and then we thought, well, and plus we have the whole extension community and this could be something that we could do in ESP that might catch the interest of other uh, extension workers in the US who maybe maybe are not ESP members, but so this was an opportunity to do a little promotion for ESP as well, but we thought if we do this right, we can go to the entire extension community and try to raise uh, the dollars to fund this project. Uh, much to our surprise and very much a big thank you is, is when we brought the proposal to the board, the board agreed to match the money, any money that we raised up to $2,500. And so if we could raise $2,500 through our, through our efforts as a global relations committee, uh, we could have a project funded at, at, at five thousand dollars, and we thought we can do something with that. Uh, so that was a that was a nice surprise, and we're very happy that the board agreed to support the Global Relations Committee with with that contribution. What we did was a, a uh, GoFundMe campaign. So we did it out on the open internet to raise the dollars, and went directly to the members um, to to uh, to manage the donation process and. Uh, we raised a little over three thousand dollars, so we did better. We 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 topped our goal, which made us happy. 
Um, we, we, the donations, we thought we would get small donations of five and $10, but actually most people uh, gave much more than that. And so that, that was also a good thing. Uh, we also received some uh, donations from chapters who, who raised the money at their annual meetings or other ways to support the efforts. We got chapter donations. We got a bunch of member donations. And, um, and one thing we hope we would get is we got about 25% of the funds from people outside the extension system who saw what we are doing on GoFundMe, thought it was of, of interest and value and, and contributed. So we had a lot of strangers uh, looking at what we were doing. I don't, I don't know if they're strangers, maybe they knew about us in other ways. We don't know a lot about the people, but they weren't people who were part of the actual uh, ESP membership or even the extension community uh, who contributed uh, to help us make this project a reality. We're in the first year of actually implementing the program right now. Uh, so with our $5,000, what, we what we've been able to fund, and, and this is amazing because this would not happen here at this rate, but, but basically with the $5,000 we've raised, we funded the tuition for four students for their whole full college experience, so all four years. So for, for that, uh, investment of $5,000, we're buying four years of, of college education for four students. Uh, these students now have been selected. They're in the program. Uh, they're studying agriculture, and they have extension mentors within Cambodia that are starting to, to groom them for their future career as extension professionals. Um, and so uh, that's what we're doing, and it started and it's working well so far. We're happy with where we're at. Uh, we're about eight months into our first year of, of funding the students. Uh, the big project requires that the students in their junior and senior year do some active research and extension projects. And so they'll be actually doing within country some extension projects to get experience, and that's where we look for lots of involvement from uh, from ESP and helping uh, with that effort uh, beyond just the funding part of this. Uh, uh, we think it's something that's not a one and done, but it can, it, it will help us build these relationships. It builds relationships with, with USAID and, and Feed the Future. Uh, and most of us who've worked in international work know that the reason that we get the opportunities to do these experiences is because we have strong networks. So we know somebody somewhere who thinks we have some expertise we could bring to a project that they buy out our time, uh, they make the effort to help us get involved. Uh, so we're hoping that through this, we'll get some familiarity with our extension people and the Kansas State Lab and that this will lead to future opportunities for our, for our uh, ESP members uh, working internationally. Uh, the, the Kansas State Lab works in eight countries. And so this is a pilot project. We're doing it now uh, in Cambodia for the first year to see how it works. And we probably won't be doing an evaluation for another year or so until the students start to actually do their extension projects. But uh, we have two important evaluation questions that we need to ask ourselves. One, is it working in Cambodia? Is it producing the results we hope to produce in Cambodia and attracting top students into extension careers? Uh, but we also want to know, is it working for ESP members? Is it creating opportunities for us? Is it expanding our network? Are we getting the opportunity to do the kinds of things, um, uh, exchange programs, other things that might come out of uh, this, this direct collaboration with this project? And then we want to ask the question, is it a model that we can use for expanding to other countries? Uh, the Kansas State Feed the Future Lab works in eight different countries. Uh, and so if this works in Cambodia, and we chose Cambodia because we thought it was the best situation. They were the most ready to do this at this time. And so that was one of the reasons we, we wanted to pick a, a country where we thought the chances for success were high. Uh, but we also need to ask the question then is if this works and it's doing what we hope it will do, can we expand this then to, to other countries in the future? And then the last thing that's starting to happen just now, because we are in just the first year of this and the students are just starting their, their education, but uh, we'll need to be recruiting ESP mentors to work directly with the students. Uh, this might lead to some opportunities for some in-country visitation, but we also see like we could use technology like what we're using today here with Zoom to do the same sorts of things at a distance, working with the students and providing them some advice and, and help 
with their extension projects when they uh, when they get started. Uh, so that's kind of the basis of it. Uh, if you would like more information, if you'd like to be a mentor and like to be considered to, to work in the project, um, you know, to, to be on one of these committees in, in ESP, you do not have to be an official member of the committee. Uh, I worked with the Global Relations Committee for three years, maybe four years before I actually, actually became on the committee. Uh, and so there's opportunities to get involved right now. So if you're interested in, in working in this more or wanting more information, uh, please let me know. With that, I will uh, turn it back to you, uh, Marianne. Thank you, Kevin. You have a wealth of expertise, and we appreciate you sharing. Kevin Thanks. worked really hard getting this program off the ground with Cambodia. And Peggy is now going to be changing the screen to Barbara Brown. So while she's doing that, I'll read her bio. Barbara A. Brown earned her Master of Arts in International Relations with a Political Economy Specialty from the University of Southern California, London, England program. She has a postgraduate certificate in International Family and Community Studies from Clemson University. Barbara is an ESB Life member and she's retired from Clemson University with 25 years experience as a Cooperative Extension Service Community Development Agent. She lived 12 years in Europe with her husband who served in the Air Force as a, and retired as a first sergeant. Upon retiring, Brown herself founded and serves as the president of the Citizen Center for Public Life, a nonprofit organization using deliberative dialogue to help solve local, and global problems. Barbara's project with Guinea-Bissau is building on the research of eliminating hunger and extreme poverty, both locally and globally sim simultaneously. Take it away, Barbara. Thank you, Mary Ann. I wanna lift up that simultaneous and actually build on some things that Kevin had said. It's built on the idea that if local farmers and people living in other countries work together, they can learn from each other and motiv motivate each other if they can do these things simultaneously. And then the whole aspect of this project is uh, sort of a whole farm management system to enhance sustainability. And it's built on the human ecology model that uh, sort of grew out of the USDA capacity building grants for SIFAR. That was children, youth, and families at risk. Go ahead. So this looks at, so what did it take to, make, to pull this together? Uh, you've heard us talk about relationships. This whole project is about building on relationships to create uh, collaborations and partnerships. Plus there was the, the interest and the concern for to eliminate hunger and extreme poverty. In the context of researching this, the, the idea that there's hunger in every single county in America gave big questions. Well, why does that exist? And then we came with the interest in, in working globally and the idea of the extreme problems in the other countries. So therefore, working locally and globally simultaneously. Um, it took a lot of support, both sort of the climate for innovation and entrepreneurship from, from Clemson to be able to build this. Uh, it had both uh, uh, professional learning and skills, but a strong background of, of uh, life experiences led to, to my involvement, particularly in this, this project. But many of the relationships, people had similar things. Go ahead, next slide. So, this sort of depicts some of the partners and collaborators that have formed from this. I'm not gonna talk about this too much right now because we'll talk about it more on another slide, but bringing up the idea of the funding, um, the government of Guinea-Bissau through other relationships and partners that have been there, creating that, that partnership with the government of Guinea-Bissau, they paid for five farmers to come to Johns Island, a small organic farm on Johns Island in South Carolina and they stayed uh, six weeks working with a local farmer. And that local farmer on the left is Renee Tuning uh, under the local part, standing with one of the Guinea-Bissau farmers. 
she will have a chance to go to Guinea-Bissau and work along with them for about a month in November. Next slide. So the map was just of, of Guinea-Bissau. It's in the west part of South Africa. Go ahead. So the specifics of the particular project is that uh, Guinea-Bissau has approximately 36,000 square kilometers and 1.8 million people. That's about the same size amount of people that West Virginia has or Idaho has. The uh, country is very biodiverse in the, their agricultural commodities, but yet they depend very much right now just on the funds that come, the global funds that come in from growing cashew nuts. So part of the idea is to expand that uh, and expand that value chain, but to also bring in the, the grow, growth of other uh, agricultural crops to help with, a, with more financial security. Um, go ahead. So it's designed to be a 10-year project. Um, the, the, whole, the whole farm integration aspect of, of it is very important, uh, thinking not only that it'll be more sustainable, but it also builds on that human ecology model of being able to ascertain and, and access multiple resources wherever they may touch the project. Um, we want to enhance the processing zones of the Guinea of the cashews that are grown in Guinea Bissau. Uh, so there's uh, more of them and bring in some other crops. So there's more of a multi commodity effort. Uh, but a strong component is again, like Kevin talked about, how can we expand the agriculture extension efforts? How can we help with that? So farmer training and support and enhanced agriculture extension, not only in country, but partnerships from America too. There will be, of course, research going on and the whole ca cashew processing facility is to increase it to the capacity of 200,000 metric tons per year. Next. Uh, we're in the early stages and it has been self-funded so far. I mentioned Guinea-Bissau funded the farmers coming to uh, America and uh, one of our partners, Global Stratus, which is a conglomerate of both for-profit and non-profit organizations is going to cover the expenses of Brene Tuning going to uh, Guinea-Bissau. Go on to the next slide, and I think Brene might be on the phone if she wants to call in. I'm not sure. Our talk, if her, you could unmute, but you will uh, see. You there? I am here. Okay. Renee, fill in any gaps I've made, and, and you've got about a minute. <laughs> no, so you're doing wonderfully. Now, we had some wonderful experiences here. I think they were able to learn a lot. We, my farm is quite similar in size to the two-kilometer farms that most of these farmers have. Um, and they had an opportunity to really, on a day-to-day -day basis, experience working on an integrated, diverse um, organic farm with livestock as well as crops um, and different value-added products as well. Move to another slide while Renee's finishing, please. We did have a lot of difficulty with language barriers. They were initially supposed to have had some basic English language training and of course Guinea-Bissau is a Portuguese speaking country. So I had no background in Portuguese. They had no English, which um, made it for a rather entertaining opportunity for everybody. But we were able to find common um, commonality in the work that we were doing so that we could communicate. And Clemson was wonderful in providing um, translators for us when it came to some of the work that we were doing and some of the training that they were receiving. I know I experienced the the global translator one time. I had a whole list of questions that would fit with some of my deliberative dialogue work. We didn't get very far with that, but we did do some interchange, so we learned. Um, is Dave Lamy on the phone? He was going to try to call in from France. If 
I have not seen um, an international okay. caller. Well, we thought that that might be difficult to do, but Dave Lamy was a big support for both Renee and myself on, on different things that we were trying to put together to make this happen. And he's uh, doing a lot of efforts right now with agribusiness development and supporting many of the uh, community development agents. So he's sort of our um, ongoing campus contact that might refer us to someone else or that kind of thing. But it's good to have that type of support that we can just call up and say, hey, we have this need. Who could we talk to on campus that might help us with this? And so he's been. I did just unmute one microphone that I don't know who it is. Could we um, ask one more time if Dave is on, just in case that was his mic? Dave. It is a phone caller. Dave, let me you on? Must not be. Okay. Okay, so you can go ahead and move on. Uh, one of the questions in the chat box had to do with other opportunities. Uh, and I know the other committee members can share some more, plus the, the, we have some information from USDA to share, I think. But this is one thing that could, where people could get involved in this project if they wanted to. Uh, you'll see on the webinar, uh, there will be a webinar on July 11th. Uh, and if you click on that link and you will get a copy of this, this presentations on, uh, on email. But if you click on that link, most of the time something comes up with a, uh, 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 a connection to this webinar and you can register for that. So you can move off of that. And then you will see others there. There's opportunity if you're interested in collaboration or volunteering opportunities. There's another link with Global Stratus that those opportunities might be available. And then there's the overall Global Stratus website that gives you sort of very, if you dig long enough, there's very comprehensive information on the management plans and different things of how this Guinea-Bissau project and other projects in Africa will transpire. So it's designed to be uh, very collaborative, building on relationships and partnerships. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Renee, did you have anything else to say? Well, one of the things that I think was really important for us to find, to work on too was the idea that some many of the diseases that can become a problem for our country's food security and food supply actually originate there. Ah. So we, you know, will definitely want to have some additional work done in those areas. And that's where the research lab uh, opportunities will be very important too. Okay. Thank you. Why don't we go through our slide of resources and then we can open mics and have questions in the chat box or even um, orally because we do have uh, 15 minutes or so left that if we wanted to have some discussion, we could certainly do that. So one go through, um, just mention this slide. I don't know, Barbara, if you want to, you brought most of these resources if you want to bring them. Okay, um, this actually was provided by Lisa Luxman at uh, USDA. She is now the uh, uh, national program leader at the international program. She sent uh, some nice information that we'll make available to everyone that was on this call. And she sent these resources with USDA in a nice concise uh, effort that you can see them all. So we thank Lisa for this. And we thank uh, USDA for the support of our overall uh, webinar on this. But uh, uh, I'm glad that somebody had already asked for resources, so we have some for you. Thank you, Barbara. And we, and we do appreciate the fact that NIFA, our National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is including international activities as an effective way for us to help achieve research, educational, and extension objectives important to our U.S. agriculture. And Peggy, do you have any questions? Well, the question that, um, that Barbara mentioned earlier uh, came in and it just basically um, is about joining an international effort that's being planned or in progress and is there any way to connect through ESP or other agencies 
um, besides her own university. Um, we have a couple other questions, but I see in our list of webinar participants, Selena Willie. Um, Selena, would you like to say a few words about what our ESP Global Relations Committee has planned? Can, can you help me unmute? Uh -huh. I, I can hear Selena, you. Selena, you're unmuted. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I thought I was muted. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, so I'm part of the Global Relations Committee and um, I've done some international work in Africa and in Central America through our uh, Legume Innovation Lab at uh, Michigan State University. I'm currently at Utah State University, but I have continued that, that work. And uh, one of the, the most recent opportunities that I've had to um, explore was a visit at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños, uh, where Michigan State uh, currently partners by exchanging students. Uh, some of those students were uh, taking classes from me, and so um, I had an opportunity to visit the university last year, kind of looking at uh, expanding uh, opportunities, not just from, for students, but for professionals, and they were very open to that. So while I was visiting there last year in May, we were able to arrange a series of visits that would be relevant to extension professionals. So we're right in the midst of putting together an agenda to offer um, that as a professional development uh, opportunity to look at extension from a, a different perspective, you know, beyond what we know in the U.S. Um, I think it's going to be uh, a great learning opportunity for all of us. And it's all hinging on the idea, you know, because sometimes we get questioned, you know, why are you doing this type of work when your focus should be your county or your state? But there's a very uh, easy logic to it. And what I call um, thinking global, acting local, is how uh, people can quickly understand it. Our demographics in the U.S. have uh, dramatically changed, and we have in a lot of our communities folks from all over the world. So it it uh, is important for us as uh, professionals to have this competency to work uh, across cultures and be able to understand, you know, how this clientele in our counties and in our states uh, think, you know, or how are they different for in terms of what their educational needs are. So putting ourselves out there, being able to get out of um, what we know and uh, learning from other extension professionals is, is and interacting in a, in a context that is different than what we know is very valuable for a professional development. And so that's how, uh, you know, a lot of administrators uh, are able to uh, support that as a professional development experience. And I'm looking forward to seeing more uh, beyond the folks in the global relations in my own chapter uh, interested in participating. And I'll just add um, very impressive timeline for getting, getting this um, international study tour underway. The proposal has the study tour occurring in 2020, so really not that that far away. Uh, so everybody, the ESP member is on thinking about that. Like the person, Julie, who asked the question, um, be watching in our ESP newsletters as well as at the national conference this fall. We'll be talking more about um, this Philippine study tour. At this time, um, I'd like to ask any of our presenters if you have anything else you would like to add. There's no specific questions coming in right now. I can also, um, if anybody wants to put anything in the chat box, um, I'm monitoring that. I also can unmute microphones if you are, a few people are self-muted as well as muted by me, the, um, the organizer. So if anybody would like to um, you know, open their mic and, and ask a question um, verbally, we can do that as well. But um, first of all, any presenters, while well, our presenters are 
maybe wrapping up or giving last thoughts, I'm going to put into the chat box a link to an online survey that we would like you to um, take. It's an evaluation of our webinar. So go ahead. But I would like to add that uh, the, the 100,000 strong initiative uh, is still uh, sending requests for proposals uh, for different countries. I know that uh, at this point, I, I think there is something with uh, Guatemala, uh, Honduras, and El Salvador. Uh, but, you know, sometimes are in uh, Ecuador, Peru, and uh, basically Latin American countries. And uh, these RFPs are typically posted once a month, once every um, once every uh, six to twelve weeks. So, uh, if you don't see an RFP uh, on the website that you're interested in today, uh, it's always good to check back in another month or so. We do have a question from um, that has come in on the chat box. Has global relations been in the um, Caribbean or South America? I think we've kind of touched on that, but would you go ahead and reiterate? Well, um, uh, Dr. Quintero and I are not formally a part of the global relations structure, but uh, our project uh, was in Colombia. And through some of the foundational work that's been established, we have other MOUs in Colombia. We have, yeah. Yeah. We have MOUs in Colombia uh, with the okay. university, and then also in Mexico with a, a university and a research center. And we have another MOU in Peru uh, with a private uh, company. Liz B, I can also, I've just unmuted your microphone if you'd like to add anything clarify, clarifying to your question. Okay. Um, Whatever you had done in the Caribbean. Peggy, this, this is Kevin. Um, yes. uh, we have had some programs at, at our ESP meetings from global relations members who worked a lot in Central and South America uh, through some of the farmer to farmer programs and some of the volunteer efforts. And uh, we could get, and I'm, I'm guessing in, in the links that Lisa provided, there's some of those opportunities are in there, but if not, we could elaborate on those some as well, because there's plenty of opportunities for, for the volunteer efforts to get this kind of experience, uh, not only in, 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 the Americas, but also in Africa and other places as well. Okay, thank you. Nancy, and I guess, go ahead. Yeah, I was, um, as I indicated earlier, this isn't through the uh, global relations structure, but earlier I did make reference to USDA's capacity building program. And uh, we, we do have another project at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff in Guyana, where we are sending faculty and staff over to build uh, capacity in, bio, in the biotechnology area. And through this grant, we have also facilitated uh, uh, education abroad experiences, and we've brought students over uh, for um, graduate level study at the master's level. So uh, if we look at it from the standpoint of, you know, the basic collaboration, um, uh, I, I do think that uh, if you're at a small university, don't have a big budget, uh, scan the environment, look for those funding opportunities because uh, it's not just the specifics of the grant that makes a difference, but how it has a catalytic effect that propels learning and engagement in other ways. This, this is Barbara. One of the questions also talked about uh, the scope of extension work in other countries, and I know Kevin had mentioned more of that. Um, I know um, when I was, when I was, before I retired, I'd done some work with uh, Afghanistan too, and they didn't have the, the real strong extension going, but there was very much an interest in that. And so there was 
you know, emails back and forth and things and uh, talking about universities there that they could, they could tap with and, you know, potential partners. So there was an interest I found myself, but Kevin mentioned that, he had, that there are multiple ones. I don't know if he wanted to add to that. Yeah, the, the question really is, um, could you give a picture of the scope of extension around the world if any of our presenters, Kevin or others, uh, would like to chime in as well as what Barbara has just added? This person also added, um, new to extension, but has worked in international education. My experience is that um, the American concept of extension is quite unique. And um, based upon my work in, uh, in Africa, Nigeria, for example, uh, extension is a concept that's understood, uh, but very seldom operationalized. So one benefit of projects of this nature is that uh, other partners, other countries are able to gain some understanding of, of how vital a role extension can play in linking that research to applied practice. Uh, and technical assistance uh, to farmers, um, whether small, medium, or large. Uh, I, I think the U.S. government, I think we have a lot to offer in helping other nations build stronger extension systems. And, and I think even Kevin mentioned that we're just not as engaged as we could be. And that, that was one of the outcomes from, from this project in uh, Senal Angostura, they are very interested in um, setting up something uh, on that venue, on, on the extension um, part of the, mm -hmm. of the academy. So um, they want to have that function part, and they were looking at, uh, at UAPB as, uh, as an example of how to implement um, extension in, in Colombia. Kevin, did you want to comment on this one before we move on to the next question? It's just that extension in, in other countries is organized differently than the U.S. And, and the thing that's unique about the U.S. is that it has this direct connection to the university and that it's the cooperative extension system and so that we bring these partnerships together to work locally. Uh, when you get international, you realize there are all kinds of problems with bureaucracy and dysfunctional government and funding and the, the issues are, are not small, uh, but some countries are making some incredible progress. For example, in Ethiopia, there's over, in Ethiopia, there's over 50,000 extension workers. Every college graduate from uh, an agricultural university in Ethiopia, if they want to work in extension, they're promised a job. Uh, so it's, 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 you know, you see it all over the board in terms of, of, uh, of success and failure and problems like, like, one of the common things I've heard when traveling is, is the extension workers don't have money for the gasoline to put in their motorcycles so they can get out to the villages. So, so you, you see a full gambit of, of situations, but I wouldn't say that extension globally is, uh, it, it, I wouldn't say it's in a strong position. We have lots of work to do, and, and that's where I think we in the U.S. could do lots to help. And, I, I, and we're doing it on a small scale, but it feels good to be doing something. <laughs> Just in our final minutes, um, the, we did, I think the, this one really deserves the expertise of our presenters here today. Um, a, a comment and question from um, Global Relations Work at Ohio State Extension and that they have a $4,000 grant for a pilot trip to, the, to Honduras to establish a partnership. Uh, how do you, she asks, how do you suggest we get the word out most effectively to gain support until our actions prove our effectiveness? So gaining support for this international work. And we just have a couple uh, minutes left. Well, basically getting in contact with uh, a university in, in Honduras will be uh, probably the first step. Um, and, but need to, like, in, in what areas in agriculture or so basically based on that we'll be looking at the at what university to contact um there is a place over there it's called uh, samorano 
which is a, a huge university and uh, it's very strong in aqua agriculture, agriculture and aquaculture. And uh, they will be um, really good people to work with. Uh, if you want, I can uh, put you in contact with, with them. That is a great idea. You know, if um, anyone has any questions that they can contact our presenters. Yes, we will have to wrap up in a minute. Um, Nancy Cadwell, a member of our Global Relations Committee, has put forth a, a shameless plug for our committee's global, um, <laughs> global relations basket, the basket that we put together at our national ESP conference, which will be in Colorado Springs in October. So if you have traveled nationally or have some items that you would be willing to donate to our basket that we auction off, um, please do bring them to the National Conference in Colorado Springs later this year. Um, what we can do if our presenters each have um, a few more minutes, I would like to turn it over to Marianne to wrap up. I, um, I hope that our participants can um, sort of look in the chat box. We have some, some thoughts there. Um, but we will, I'll let Marianne wrap up officially and then everyone that wants to can stay on for a few more minutes and uh, we can discuss these last few questions if you like. So if your question didn't get answered or you have something that you'd really like to discuss, I think our presenters probably each have just a few more minutes after we make our final wrap up. Marianne? Okay, and I would like to uh, invite everybody that's uh, on the Zoom meeting to, on the webinar to, Keep in touch with NIFA because there are a lot of different projects going on. I'm looking at grantees that are like Michigan State working, got a grant from the Hatch Multi-State Grant. And then University of Missouri has a grant that they're working with Ireland. So there are a lot of different ones on here. And I do want to really appreciate we our people from Arkansas, University of Arkansas Pine Glass. Dr. Herbert Quintero and Dr. Pamela Moore for talking about their project in Columbia. And then Dr. Kevin Gamble for talking about ESP's Global Relations Committee's program with Cambodia in its first year. And then Barbara Brown, who is on our Global Relations Committee and her project with Guinea-Bissau. We do appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.